There you go. You are now being recorded. Good. Your your technology is so much better than mine and your technological knowledge. That's who it was pushing a button. It was that easy. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's, I could probably figure that out too. Um, do you want me to just tell you the highlights of what I took from our last talk so that you'll know where I where I'm where, uh, where I'm gathering information? I'll leave it entirely up to you how you want to do it. Okay. Um, I like your phrase, random acts of genealogical kindness. Um, you also referred to your work as the dash between two, was it numbers or years? The two, the two dates on a gravestone. The two dates on a gravestone, okay. You said that you did family genealogical research in Russian, Ukrainian, and uh, German materials, primarily right. German, right? Right. And that's, that's where you got experience with a lot of reading of handwritten documents. Correct. You, al you also um, do some transcription for Ancestry.com. I've done very little of that. Uh, I have from, from time to time done a couple of different things, you know, where like I'll see something on a document and I think that they miss either, either they didn't transcribe it properly or, or that they missed it because of other research that led me to believe that the name should have been something different. So I, I you know, I've done a lot of those kinds of things. Okay. Um, I took two quotes from you. One, you said that as you were, um, when you discovered the McRae mystery, you said to yourself, how do they not know anything about this guy? He was a Supreme Court justice. How can this be in this day and age? And then speaking of his tombstone, you said, it's a shame what shape his tombstone is in. This should be rectified. McRae is an important part of our Florida history. This is his last resting place, a broken tombstone. That's, so I, that is what I said. Okay. Um, shall we just start with questions? Absolutely. Okay. Why not? <laughs> Should we quant try to quantify anything about your work in the article? Talk about how many hours you've put in, how many days, how many contacts. Is there anything that we well, give I, it to that kind I, of body? Without, without reconstructing, you know, what I did and going through, like, all of my emails and, and all of that stuff, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I, I can tell you that you know, I work primarily in a field that deals with cases on a contingency basis. And so I got away from the billable hours. And, and so my wow. mind doesn't work in that kind of a way anymore. So I, I, don't think of, I don't think of these projects in terms of like how many hours I spend or, or how many emails I sent or any of that kind of stuff. I just look at it in the, in the sort of... Uh, I guess, I guess the way I see it is I'm a detective in history and I'm trying to find the clues that will lead me to the answer to whatever the given problem might be. And so that, and that's kind of, that's kind of the way I look at it. So quantifying it, I mean, I mean, we talked earlier uh, about um, sort of uh, when we were looking through some earlier stuff, like when I got involved, I, I think it was around June or something of this year um, could have been earlier. Um, if you give me one second, I can look at my emails and give you a better sense of that because I would have started by sending maybe some emails out. Um, you, you mentioned June 9 and someone at the Key West uh, Historical okay. Society. Yep, so that but, was that was probably it. Then. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that made me ask about quantification was just, you started in June, it's not even the end of September, and you've written an article based on extensive research into something that clarifies a, a, a two century mystery. And the fact you could do that in four months when it is a hobby, when you were doing it not as your full-time job, yeah. not as your elected job, 
it just, it, I think it seems daunting. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think if you, if you were to be, uh, be given the thing as a, as a project, and you were trying to figure out the scope of that project and what you would need to do to kind of fulfill it, then it may seem daunting. But the reality is that it, it was really, um, I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I have to just use the word fortuitous that in many instances, I hit upon the right people to sort of ask the questions that needed to be asked of where I might go from here or what their thoughts are. And, and ended up ended up being led to the exact right places. You know, uh, the, for instance, uh, with Denim, for example, you know, I reached out to him. I, I, did, I don't really know him. I, I haven't read any of his works. Uh, in doing a little bit of research, I found some of the stuff that he had done, reached out to him thinking he might have some insight. He told me to look in Virginia. And he knew that off the top of his head because he, he was, uh, familiar with the history of Tyler and stuff like that. So that led me to, uh, you know, looking in other places that made sense. One of my questions was whether if there is room and there won't be much, if there is anyone like Denim, especially a Floridian, that we should mention um, in the article. Well, uh, the archivist, uh, Rick, that helped, Eric, that helped me out, um, you know, I mean, he obviously uh, had some great insight into stuff. And, uh, you know, his, his memory of what happened with Clarabelle was really uh, insightful. Um, I also was lucky enough to actually track down the descendants of the Dade family who were responsible for the cemetery. And had some conversations with them. They were very generous with some of their materials. So that was that was very helpful. Um, when I reached out uh, to the Heslop family uh, through Ancestry.com, because I had tracked down um, McRae's former law partner, his descendants, and they got right back to me. And, uh, you know, interestingly, uh, there is an author that wrote um, and had a lot of information about Heslop's son-in-law, who was a, a, a well-known sheriff in the uh, San Francisco area, um, and it was the Wild West back in those days, who had written extensively about the family, but uh, the descendants were like, he got it all wrong, he never reached out to us, um, you know, so it, it's interesting, you know, sort of their perspective on things um and their insight into it they didn't ultimately have any information on mccray but it was still a, a an interesting part of the journey to talk to them you had to do so much of that i mean you you researched into the history of the other george mccray i did i did well you know it's funny because the george mccray that you're talking about who was involved in you know harvard theology and all of that kind of stuff i did a little research on him but there were at least two or three other george w mccrays that were false leads in in doing this stuff so i had to expand my research on that and kind of figure out if this was the right person or not and then of course when i put together my chronology um in the beginning I was really confused because there's a George W. McRae in the San Francisco area who lives into the 1880s. And it wasn't until I backtracked on his ancestry and traced his family tree that I found out that he was from other places and there were no, there was no connectivity to, you know, no logical connectivity to the life of the George W. McRae that we've been researching. And, and that was the one you had mentioned to me the other day. You had said you went on Ancestry.com to find out more about him. So it, yes. it, it's not a straight line. You have a lot of extra paths and yes. diversion. Yes. You know, the, the fortunate thing about doing research uh, on McRae is that he has an unusual spelling to his name. Um, if, if it had been M-C-C-R-A-Y or some other variant of that, and there may very well be records out there that are variants of the spelling that he used while he was a justice that are actually records of his. I, I didn't go that next level of research to, to try to track down those things because there may very well be other documentation out there. Um, 
one of the cardinal rules of genealogy, uh, particularly when you're dealing with stuff from like the, the 1800s and before, is that spelling does not count. And a lot of times, you know, um, e either it was because of the level of education of the people that were writing things down or, or that the person that they were dealing with was an immigrant with a very heavy accent or something, they often got the spelling wrong. And uh, also, as I pointed out earlier, many times the transcriptions of the spelling because of the way that their handwriting was, um, you know, an I looks like an E and uh, an N looks like a U. And it, so it, it becomes sometimes a challenge in that regard. That's interesting. Um, was this unusually complex research for its sort? Um, I would say no. Um, there, there have been other research projects where I've actually had to go and pull microfilm and, and, uh, and have translations done um, and maybe reach out to people that are experts in, a, in an area, um, a geographical area that, um, you know, for example, Poland. Um, the borders of Poland in a 300 year period have changed so many times that records from a given time frame may actually be in another country. And so when you're trying to trace stuff, you have to know kind of where those records were in time and where the border was during that time frame in order to know where to look for it. In this instance, we were dealing with records that were predominantly United States based. They were uh, all exclusively in English, which makes it a lot easier. Um, many of the documents that we rely upon in order to flesh out the story were actually newspaper articles uh, that sort of traced uh, McCray's journey. And so that made it uh, also easier than uh, some of the other projects that I've been involved in. Okay. Um, were there turning points? Obviously, Mike Denham was a turning point, but was there something else where you had an aha moment or a Rosetta Stone? Yeah, sure. The finding of the very tiny news article um, where he left from New York to get on uh, a ship and go to California um, in the uh, 1847 48 time frame. Um, and then the aha of, oh, yeah, it's the 49er time frame uh, sort of helped, you know, me with it, this idea of why, why would somebody who was, you know, a native and born and raised and very involved in Virginia politics, then going to Florida because of an appointment and being a, a you know, a, a hotshot, a big wig, a, a justice of the Florida Supreme Court why would he disappear and where would he go? And then when you think about this idea that people were going out to California because of uh, gold rush fever and all of those kinds of things, you kind of you can place that in a historical context. So that was an aha for me. How did you find that article, that teeny tiny article? Were you, was that just a sweep of George W. McCray searches? You know, I did I did a lot of those, but but candidly, I can't recall whether whether I actually uh, found that in my research or in the many many people that I reached out to whether someone had actually uh, written to me and said, "Is this the guy?" You know, kind of a thing. So I would have to go back and reconstruct that to to tell you exactly how I came up with that. But um, I knew it was our guy. Okay, um, and how did you find? How, what led you to Kentucky? Um, Ancestry.com. You know, when I when I when I plugged him in, and and uh, you know, we, once we figured out some of the um, the date ranges, you know, what his age would be, sort of approximated. Uh, I started narrowing that down, and then and then found uh, a hit in Ancestry with the same, you know, George W. McCray. And the time frame seemed right, and then and then I, as I worked a little bit deeper, found one that had been born in Virginia, and and then so oh let me look at that one, and then and then that's kind of like where it led me to. Okay, was there part of this either in the process or in the discoveries that was most interesting to you? Well, I I, I still find it fascinating. 
to uh, to think about this idea that this is a guy who was very, very involved in early Virginia history and in, in the politic of the day. Um, his, his grandfather had connections with the Washington family of George Washington fame, uh, comes to Florida as a Supreme Court justice, very involved, uh, president of the Territorial Senate, um, an officer in the Freemasons, and, you know, I mean, very actively involved and then sort of drops everything and goes out to California. So that was that was surprising to me. And then and then ultimately, it was also surprising to me that, you know, in in doing the research, I came across Professor Manley and the excellent work that his team put together in in their book and, you know, was was shocked to find that they had not found any information on him um, and and sort of there were no leads. I, I mean, it, it's it's interesting to me. I mean, obviously they finished their book. They didn't they didn't do a revised edition or anything like that, where they would have gone back in maybe at a later time, like like now, where we're uh, benefiting from the fact that uh, sites like Ancestry.com or FamilySearch.org are all digitizing records. Uh, Newspapers.com. Uh, is going out there and every old newspaper that they can find, they're digitizing them and putting them online so that they have search methodologies in them. Uh, the uh, National Archives uh, has put uh, a number of uh, newspapers online and other records that are uh, searchable. So all of those things, you know, sort of coalesce in today's time frame with the ability to maybe do a lot of the legwork that they could not do digitally or by computer and then they would have to do you know i mean literally getting up from their chairs and going to the research libraries and digging into old archives and stuff that would, would have taken weeks months or years to to come up with the information that i found in a relatively short period of time this leads me to one of my later questions for you which was is there anything you can extrapolate from this research you did to say in law practice, some of these things would be very useful. I mean, have you ever done that, for example? In oh, law I, do practice, it, I do it all the time. I mean, I mean, not not to the extent, you know, where I'm digging into necessarily newspapers from, you know, the 1800s, but um, in, in handling most personal injury cases, uh, there's a great deal of research that we do on, um, how incidents may have happened, whether there are other instances, um, uh, other, other potential witnesses, uh, you know, uh, maybe checking background histories or, or uh, information on uh, some of the parties uh, that all involves a very similar sort of research methodology. So there are, there are similarities to that. And uh, What's interesting is I harken back to, um, I've been practicing 36 years now. Um, I harken back to the beginning of the internet and remember uh, in, in one case in particular where um, I actually found some newspaper articles on an individual that was involved in a case with us that, that basically blew the case wide open because this person was claiming one thing and the newspaper articles clearly demonstrated that that was not true. So um, even, even that long ago, and we're talking well over 20 years ago, um, that kind of research definitely helps in what we do as lawyers. Okay. Um, what was the most satisfying thing about this, either in the process or in the discovery? Well, in the process, the most satisfying thing, candidly, has been working with you and getting this article done. Um, uh, I, you know, like I said, I, I'm more of the research kind of a guy. I like to find these things and, you know, the labor of writing it and, and, and honing it to, uh, to something that is going to be utilized and uh, purposeful for historians and, and future readers of this history. Uh, could not have been done without your help, and and so for me that was that was extremely rewarding. Um, finding the answer uh, in and of itself it was also very rewarding. Um, obviously, 
to solve a mystery that nobody seemed to, to, to know the answer to. And, and, and of course, the one regret still is that I haven't been able to find an image of the judge. Um, but I got as close as I think I'm going to get, uh, given the, the historical circumstances and the nature of photography and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm satisfied with that as well. Okay, with Bailey and Emily's photographs you're talking That's right. about. I, I mean, I think if, if we were to go back in time and Clarabelle Jett had those two photographs to utilize as sort of her uh, exemplars for, for coming up with a, a portrait that probably looked a lot more like what he may have looked like, you know, with the facial structure and, and, and sort of the characteristics that seem to be very apparently similar in both of those photographs, um, it would have been a different portrait that, that's hanging on the wall than the one today. Yeah. Um, please also talk about the tombstone. Please, you, you, you were so, um, I mean, I, I started thinking about this this morning. You are a person who likes to make things whole or as whole as possible. You know, you're a personal injury lawyer. You're, you're going back and you're, you're tracing family history and community history. And um, I mean, the, even the work you're, you're doing on the highway where you're renaming for the, the lynching victim. And you really sounded sad when you talked about the tombstone the other day. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. Um... It, this is not my first uh, go around in regards to the tombstone issue. Um, part of the family research that I've been doing uh, over the last 15 years um, has taken me to a place called Chernowitz, which is now in the Ukraine. And there's a Jewish cemetery there where my ancestors are buried. And um, after World War II, uh, a great part of that cemetery and the uh, the synagogue that was uh, attached ne next to it were um, were damaged extensively, and uh, there has been a group of people who have been putting those back together and sort of trying to refurbish and and go in and you know the the cemetery had uh, basically laid um, laid there for probably thirty years where nobody was minding it, you know and. So the weeds had grown up all around it. Trees had grown up in, into the, the tombstones, knocked them over. Vandals had done a bunch of damage and, and stuff like that. So um, I, I am keenly aware of the historical uh, importance of those gravestones, uh, which, which bear um, references to family members and names and dates, which help people put their family trees together. Um, in addition to that, of course, um, this idea that, you know, you, you're buried in a place and, and people, you know, may or may not remember you, they may forget you, they may not know you. Um, McRae was a man who um, had a lot of historical import for our state. And of course, nobody knew anything about him, apparently. Um, this was sort of a historical mystery. And now that we know who he was and where he came from and where he's buried, um, in my mind, I think it's important that we recognize the fact that um, his legacy uh, in the state should be somehow honored and uh, people should know about it and care about it. And, and so you saw the photographs of the tombstone. Um, it's broken in half. Uh, part of the name is hard to read. Um, the, the family that owns the, the cemetery area actually owned that piece of land at one point in time and then ultimately sold it um, with um, covenants in there to reserve the cemetery plot for the family. Um, but it's surrounded by land that they no longer own. And so I don't know how often they're going in and, and actually, you know, minding the, uh, the gravestones there or anything like that. But, um, you know, when I saw the photograph, um, I was saddened by the fact that, you know, this, this guy was, was essentially lost to history.
there's there's almost a pathos about this story as he moves you know he he stopped having the the great positions of prominence in florida he moves to california seeks them we don't know exactly why he was driven back east again and then you know your point was he could almost have died at the end of a journey um, yeah. and well I, I, I don't know there. yeah i don't know that kentucky was the end of his journey uh for all i know and i was thinking about this the other day for all i know he was on his way back to virginia yeah. and you know he stopped at a place where he knew people along the way and i mean if he was making that journey across land and he was doing so um i would imagine and i and i'd have to look at the the research of the times of when the railroads got to where they were um i i know that by the 1850 <laughs> mid 1850s that they were reaching out with railroad tracks across the country and everything but i i don't know uh the exact i'd have to look that up from a historical perspective but at some point the guy's either in a coach or he's on a horse or he's walking to get where he's going and um you know he got he, he apparently got sick he, he died of dysentery according to the death records um for all i know that was a stopping point for him and he never made it home so uh i mean there's definitely uh, uh a pathos to that I mean, if you think about, you know, all he wanted to do was get home and see his family in Virginia again, and he never got there, then, you know, that makes it all, all the more sort of terrible. And there, and there's a plot, you know, remember we, we found records that show that he gave a piece of land to his brother before he left for Florida. And, and on that piece of land described in that deed is the fact that that's where the family cemetery was. So yes. You know, he's not That's buried with his family. No, but but at least he's buried with people he knew. Yes, he's buried. He's Basically. buried with friends. And and I will say that in my conversations with the Dade descendant individuals, um, they they were of a mind that somewhere in their distant past, the McCrays and the Dades and the Wallaces may be related and i haven't done that research to to figure out whether or not there's some sort of family tree relationship uh you know between them but um that that could be that they were more than friends i mean you know we saw that in lucian dade's probate records that he names both the mccrays and wallaces as uh, executors of his will and stuff so you know you you trust people many times family members to deal with those kinds of things and so um there is perhaps some sort of family relationship there it's also interesting that that the dades had emily's photograph that that's where you found her photograph yes um are you finished with mccray is this the end of your mccraying um i i think i am uh i i think that like I said, I think as far as the photograph goes, uh, I, I've tried every source that I can think of and reached out all over the country to look for some things um, and have not found anything. Um, obviously, from time to time, uh, I will look back. I, I posted on a couple of different historical sites, uh, you know, where people are looking for help with uh, historical information or things that they can't find. Um, and sometimes you're surprised by those things where you know people actually come up with stuff. Like I, I sent you the other day an email. I had forgotten that I had actually asked those people out in San Francisco about stuff. And the first email was that that the individual that normally handles that is out, and we're not sure when she's coming back. And and so I'd, I'd basically forgotten about that. And then I get an email weeks and weeks later saying uh oh by the way we did that research and unfortunately there's nothing to be found but here's some other places that you might want to look so i mean there are there are additional sources for stuff um but when i when i put it in the context of the the level that photography was at during that time frame i have very little hope that there's actually a photograph of him um 
I was surprised by the daguerreotype because that had to come out sometime in, you know, right around the 1850 time frame. Um, Cause before that really daguerreotypes were predominantly in France and not in the United States yet. They were just getting off the ground. And it wasn't until the late fifties and sixties that we started having a photographic development and then getting into sort of the Matthew Brady civil war kind of photographs and things like that. When, when it was becoming much more prevalent for people to do that, as far as any portraits are concerned, um, the fact that the Supreme Court or the Territorial Senate didn't deem it appropriate during that time frame to have portraits made of their presidents or of the early justices. And then the fact that McCray uh, died single um, without any children that I'm aware of lends strongly to the argument that there would have really been nobody that would have made a portrait of him or, or some sort of image and then, I, and then I found that newspapers actually didn't really start putting images into their newspapers um, until right around this time frame that McCray dies. They, they really weren't publishing photographs or sketches or etchings or anything like that. It was, it was after he died, uh, that later time frame, the next 10 years, when that became really in vogue. And, and they started doing that, uh, particularly as the, uh, the U.S. got into the Civil War era. It's too bad Matthew Brady didn't finish taking the photograph of your grandfather and then come down and do something yeah. around this. Okay. But that would have been that would have actually been later. So um, right, I'm, yeah. I'm not being timely on this. Yeah. Um, what do you hope will come of this? Well, I you know I hadn't I hadn't really looked at it in in uh, in the sense of anything coming out of it. Um, I I took it on more as a you know you mentioned earlier the random acts of genealogical kindness. I I took this research on sort of in the same uh, mindset um, that here was a historical almost a genealogical kind of a mystery. Um, and, and one in which I, I couldn't believe that, how do they not know who this guy was, you know, kind of a thing. And so I, I took it on more as just a, let's see what I can find out. And, and then it, then it caught the attention of, uh, the people up at the Supreme court and, and, uh, and the historical group that you, you are a part of. And, and some of the people at the Florida bar were interested um, in understanding this. And then, and then of course, talking to Denim and Manley and those guys, they all are like, wow, I can't believe you did this. And, and this is great. And, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't look at it for an outcome really. So the, the fact that y'all want to publish this is amazing to me. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm flattered and honored and, uh, and humbled by, your work process, and uh, and and I'm I'm glad I could solve the mystery. It's I, it's just thrilling, and I think for us, it's a real boon that you would come to us, and and let us publish it. I mean, it's a it's a great it's a great contribution to this state, and um, your work. You you were very kind about me earlier. I am a very small tool in the hands of somebody who's really done so much and you kept growing it. I mean, I kept being so impressed. And in a, in a very short time, you just turned it into a richer and richer story so that you can begin picturing his life. You know, when you started adding those details about, you know, moving swiftly to Columbia County and you think, yeah, how did you get from Marion County to Columbia County in two days? Yeah, he was all over the place. I mean, I, mean, I, I found a, a record of him visiting Niagara Falls, you know, where he signed the ledger. And I mean, so, you know, you're thinking, all right, here's a guy who's in Florida. Then he, you know, he's in Virginia. Then he goes to Florida. Then he goes to New York. And then he gets on a ship and he goes to California. I mean, you know, you think about the time frame that this is all happening. I mean, that's that's a pretty amazing adventure for somebody. It is, and and exhausting. I mean, your your map with the um, with the two routes that might have been possible for him to take, either one of those would have been wearing. 
Oh yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's funny because I, I I started reading. My wife bought me this book on uh, Ellis Island. It's I don't know. It's like seven hundred pages long, and it's it it starts at the beginning of time with New York, and they're describing how you know the the Dutch founded uh, New Amsterdam and how they would have come over in these wooden ships. And that some of the people that were coming over in what is today called the steerage compartment would have literally been weeks and weeks in the bottom of a ship where people were getting seasick and, and you know, dealing with issues of not having enough food and not having enough water and, and all kinds of, you know, dysentery type things and what, what they were stepping in and sleeping in and all of that kind of stuff. I, I mean, I, I just can't imagine... You know, we're talking about the eight, the mid 1800s. You know, the the level of service is not what we've come to expect today. You're not even if you're sitting in coach on an airplane. It's not like that. So yeah. it's pretty interesting. So, um, do you have other historic projects that you want to do now? Uh, well, I, I am in the middle of a couple of different things. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, I've got this coalition going on uh, regarding the lynching of Reuben Stacy, uh, which occurred here in Broward County in 1935. Um, out of that, there, there have been a couple of other um, limited research things uh, that I was working on. Um, I am in between um, doing some other stuff uh, I was asked by uh, one of the developments uh, in, in our parkland community to give a speech uh, and a talk on the Margate Blunt archaeological site that we have in parkland. Um, I, I did some research uh, a while ago. Uh, this was another one of those moments where uh, I, I attended the Parkland Historical Society meeting and they were talking about the fact that we have an archaeological site in the city that nobody knows about. And, and, and I said, well, what do you know about this archeological site? And they didn't know anything. And I, and, and I said, how can that possibly be? You know, it's sort of the same, like, wait a minute, what do you mean you don't know anything about this? And so I, I did the research on that and uh, discovered that um, back in the late forties, uh, Bruce Blunt, who was the founder of the city actually was working a backhoe and bumped into this wooden crypt and a bunch of skeletons fell out. And uh, of course he called the police and they came out and they determined that they were very old. And so they had uh, the, the coroner come out, confirm that. And then they brought in a, a woman by the name of Wilma Williams, who is an archeologist. Um, and she came out in 59 and 60 with a group of volunteers and they formed the Broward County Archeological Society. And, and started doing work on this site. And they uncovered a number of skeletal remains of wooden artifacts and other things that were very important from an archeological uh, perspective. And then of, of course, there were uh, some subsequent surveys that were done. Uh, Gypsy Graves, who was the founder of the Graves Museum uh, that opened up in Dania, Florida and had for a number of years, a whole bunch of really cool stuff, dinosaur bones and stuff. And, and, uh, and then uh, a man by the name of um, Sonny Cockrell, who was a very well-respected uh, archeologist, worked out of Florida State University um, and did a lot of underwater archeological stuff on the Western coast, uh, you know, dealing with the early uh, Indian cultures that were out here, um, came down at the behest of one of the developers, um, did some surveying out, out here and found that, uh, that this was a very, very important archeological site. And, and so he, he actually got the developer to dump a bunch of sand over the top of the site to prevent looters from coming in and, and, and digging through it and everything. And so during my research, I wanted to find where are these artifacts? And so I had to trace that history um, from the perspective of, of archaeological digs and what happened to these pieces of things that they brought out. And in, in the course of that, uh, the aha moment for that was I found at the uh, Miami History Museum that Wilma Williams had bequeathed all of her research materials to Dade County. And instead of Broward, and, and I found out later on that she, was, she had gotten into a big fight with Gypsy Graves, 
and <laughs> County over over how those artifacts were being displayed and stuff. And so she got mad at them. And so instead of giving it to Broward where she lived and where she worked or where she founded this society, she gave it to Dade County. And they had they had an entire box load of materials, including 16 millimeter films of her doing the archaeological dig in parkland. So uh, we actually have recovered all of those materials. And then from there, we tracked down a bunch of the uh, artifacts, um, some of which are still in, in different museums uh, at, at Broward College at uh, some, some of the state museums uh, down in Miami. And um, obviously they weren't just gonna give us the artifacts back, but what we did was we teamed up with the Fab Lab at North Broward Prep the kids have 3D replicators. So we took a field trip down to the museums. We got the curators to open the boxes, the glass cases where these artifacts were and allowed the kids to take detailed photographs of the artifacts. And then they recreated them in 3D animation. Um, and then on these sort of plastic, um, and I've got, hold on, I'll show you. I've got one of them. So this is a prototype of one of the artifacts that was was actually found at the site. It's it's uh it, it's actually a vulture, a vulture's head. It was part of a long stick, and this is the prototype. This is plastic that they 3D replicated, and then the kids painted it to look exactly like the actual artifact looked. And we were able to put a big display up in the in the library in the city and everything. And and uh, and so now I'm going to be doing a talk on that um, in November. And um, I, I googled you before before writing my questions because I'd hoped that there'd be more ability to to talk about you. And I saw that Mrs. Blunt died this year, and you. You mentioned uh, yes. you spoke about her in in the obituary or the the news story, but it talked about her husband finding all those artifacts and yes. the idea that you've traced all that back. That's just that's amazing. It's just amazing. Um, what what have I missed that you think needs to go into this story? Um, I don't. I don't know that you've really missed anything. Um, I. I think we've covered everything. I mean. I mean. Obviously, uh, I've had a, help, a lot of help along the way in terms of people reaching back to me and giving me clues and stuff like that to, to maybe you know lead me to other areas of inquiry. But the real, the real boon for historical researchers now is this idea that there are so many websites that have available materials for doing the research um, and, uh, you know, in, in a number of different ways, it's really a matter of how you look at it. You know, I, lo I looked at it as, as just a, I guess, cause I have a curious mind, like, like how do they not know who this guy is kind of a thing, you know, and, you know, and that led me to this stuff, but there are, there are a number of things that the, the information available now allows you to do that, this research that we're doing on like the Reuben Stacy lynching project, for example, um, has led to a lot of new uh, details that we didn't know before um, and, and clarified some things. Uh, there is a group of people that are uh, the actual descendants of uh, Mary Turner, who was another unfortunate woman that was lynched, um, I believe in Georgia, and they believed for the longest time that the photograph of Reuben Stacy that, um, that was actually used by the NAACP back in the, in the 30s and 40s to try to get the United States legislature to pass an anti-lynching bill um, was actually a photograph of their relative uh, who died in Georgia. And, and so it's clarifying a bunch of different things um, from a historical perspective and, and, and giving a lot of people new insights in, into different things. Um, also in regards to Reuben Stacy, you know, the news articles written in the day had him being sort of like a vagrant individual who had gone up to this white woman's house and 
That's not true because the census records demonstrate that he was a husband and he was a father and that he lived in a home in Fort Lauderdale and that he was a hardworking man. And, and so, you know, some of, some of the uh, myths that have grown up out of, I don't want to say fake news, but news that was slanted um, maybe because of the historical perspective of the day is now uh, being changed by some of the research that's now readily available online. So, uh, you know, it's my hope that the information that we uncover relative to uh, Justice McCray now gives people new insight in, into him and um, into what his world was like. Um, it's, it's interesting to note the dichotomy and, and sort of grasp at this idea that while we might revere him for being the first justice of the Florida Supreme Court, we also might be uh, repulsed by the idea that he owned slaves or that his family owned slaves or that he was um, involved in this idea that ultimately led to the Civil War because he wanted Florida to continue to be a Confederate state and to continue the, you know, the, the idea of slavery and the use of people and humans for uh, labor and, and as property. And, and uh, you know, so that's, that's interesting as well, you know, sort of this yin and yang of what the world is like. This has just been a delight for me. This has been wonderful. I I'm so glad to learn more about you. I regret, I, I certainly think given the choice of how to spend um, magazine pages that the more we can give over to, to your article, the more important that is. But your story is a very interesting story that could go on for several pages as well. And I, I'm glad I get to know it as somebody who's, who's been introduced to you this way because as a reader, um, I think people are going to miss out on a lot by not understanding the full range uh, of what I, you do. I mean, listen, don't get me started because I, I could talk to you about my wife and my kids too. And, and uh, to me, they're, they're the unsung heroes. I mean, my wife is a, a 17 year high school teacher and she went through the Parkland shooting. And so there's a lot, you know, a lot for me to tell you about that. My daughter uh, was very involved um, in you know, the, the march and, uh, and, and led the kids here in, in the city to, um, you know, to, to really push what is critically important for, I think, the world um, in, in regards to an understanding of gun violence and all those kinds of things. And she works as a speech pathologist and she's involved in a whole bunch of different things that are really helping give back to the universe and stuff. So there's lots there's lots that I'd love to, to talk about that's not me. Well, your family must be remarkable. And I hope that Mr. Rader has as satisfying a life in the, in the partnership you all set up oh, to make me, yourselves able to do things that you enjoy doing. So trust me, he good. does. He does. It's, it's, a, it's, a pleasure, it's a pleasure to know you. I will, I will draft this um, by no later than sometime tomorrow, send it to you, do what I did to you, tear it up, you know, make, make suggestions, ask questions. And um, when you're happy with it, we'll send it on to Melanie. And, oh, thank, um, thank you very much. Then she'll move on it. Thank you. I hope you have a great weekend, perhaps better than the one you had last Saturday's game. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. Take Thank care. you. All right. Bye -bye. Oh, may I? Um, will I have access to this recording as well if I should I, need I, it? I, I should be able to make a copy of it and send it to you or put it in like a Dropbox or something that will enable us to share it. My hunch is that because of the limits on space, I am not going to use lots of long quotations. I'll use phrases. I'll use things like that. So, so following this um, may not be quite so necessary to go back to it, but um, it, either you should feel free to do that if it's handy for you to do that, or if I have a question and, and need you to, I will ask you um, for it. So Okay, no problem. Way. Okay, thank you. All right, thank bye -bye. you. Be well. Okay.